I describe learning as a cornerstone of software engineering. Doing a great job of software development depends upon us becoming expert at learning. Learning about the problems that we are solving, learning which approach works best, which architecture works best, which design works best. If you want to take an engineering approach to writing great software, these are ideas that we simply can't avoid. So if we want to be great at learning, where do we start? We start with iteration. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, Specflow, and our new sponsor, Linode. They're all helping to support our channel, so please do support them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. This episode is part of a series that I plan to release over, over time, exploring some of the ideas that are in my new book, Modern Software Engineering. It's on sale now, so far the reviews have been pretty good. So do take a look, there's a link to that in the description too. Modern software is complex stuff, and complex things don't spring fully formed from the minds of their creators. When we start out, we're never really certain what our software needs to do, at least not to the level of detail that we need to be to make sure to, to make it work. We are never sure about the best design. Our views on that will inevitably change as our understanding of the problem and our solutions to it deepen. If we are doing something new, or at least new to us, we won't be sure about the technology either how to organize cells, to deliver the architecture of our system, or what color the buttons should be. The creation of any complex system, and certainly the creation of any complex software system, is an act of exploration and discovery. If you do know all of these things before you start, it means that you've already explored the problem in enough detail to know what the code should be. The only real way to do that is by writing the code. So why would you bother writing it again for a second time, when the cost of reproducing it is always essentially free? This may seem obvious, but I'm pretty sure that it isn't obvious to everyone. Many organizations still structure software development based on the assumption that they either know all of this stuff already, or if that they work hard enough analyzing the problem, that they'll be able to know it in enough detail uh, to be able to predict what's going to happen. But they can't, this is an illusion. Customers and users don't really know what it is that they want. If you ask them and give them what they ask for, they'll be disappointed. Usability experts have known this for a very long time. Businesses don't know what they want either. The data says that two thirds of business ideas produce zero or negative value for the business that undertake them. Our best guesses for a design don't always turn out to be good ideas either. However good we are, most problems that we tackle are much too big to hold in total in our heads, so we have to compartmentalize them. So we're inevitably going to learn new things as we move from one compartment in the problem to another. These new things can and often will invalidate our previous thinking, or at least modify it. That's another part of the learning that I'm talking about here. What all this means is that we don't get to create complex systems in their entirety. We have to organize our work differently to that, in a way that allows us to grow our understanding bit by bit. The development of complex systems is a kind of guided evolution, and we are the guides, a process of experimentation where we, step by step, try out our ideas and test them. For that, we have to work iteratively and incrementally. Incrementally, so that we can focus on parts of the system separately from others, and so make progress as a sequence of changes. Iteratively, so that we can see our progress and how and if our ideas fit together as we proceed and move us in the direction that we're aiming for. Iteration is defined like this. A procedure in which repetition of a sequence of operations yields results successively closer to a desired result. 
That may sound like a pretty dry description, but in reality, iteration is a deeply powerful, fundamentally important attribute of any means of making progress. Amongst other things, this is how evolution works and how the process of discovery organised by science works. The really interesting thing about iteration is that last part in the definition about making progress towards a desired result. The surprising thing is that you can do this by working iteratively even when you don't know what your desired result is. Or if you change your mind part way through and move your target somewhere else. To do this, we need some measure, a fitness function of some kind that can tell us if we are closer to or further from our goal. Part of this game is to decide on that fitness function, depending on what it is that we think that we want. It could be a product goal, more users, more money, it, better customer satisfaction perhaps. It could be a technical goal, high stability, higher throughput or lower latency perhaps. Whatever our target, given a suitable fitness function and enough time, we can now hit it as long as we keep iterating and it isn't physically impossible. This is true even when we decide to move the goal. This is very, very different to more traditional planned approaches where we fix the goal at the start. One of the reasons that iterative approach approaches work better, and the data is in, they definitely work a lot better, is that we can iterate on what counts as success too. Of course, that's rather dangerous. If you watch my conversation with Goiko Adzik a few weeks ago, he described a couple of big project failures where the cause of the failure was simply moving the goalposts in unhelpful ways. This gets us back to our fitness function. We have to be really careful that what we measure really matters. That it is an outcome of some kind rather than just some kind of internal side measure or side effect of the way of us doing work. So things like story points or lines of code um, or features that aren't yet releasable don't count. They don't work as an effective measure of progress. However many story points your team produces, it's meaningless if you're working on stuff that no one wants. Partially complete features don't tell us how partially complete they are. We don't know that until we are ready to release. Features that we create but don't yet release are guesses. We don't really know that our users will like or will use them. So we need fitness functions that can evaluate the usefulness of our features and the real progress that we are making. In terms of the quality and effectiveness of our development process, maybe. There's another angle to this. If the only way that we can build systems is to understand everything that we need to do before we start, then however hard we work, however smart we are, that places a limit on the complexity of the systems that we can build. At some point, we become limited by our capacity to hold things together. At some point, we either have to abstract so far that our model of what happens becomes unrealistic and so our plans and assumptions are bound to be wrong, or we place a limit on, the, on how complex a system we are willing to begin work on. Working iteratively and incrementally cures this problem. We don't need to understand everything before we begin. As we've seen, we don't even need to choose the correct destination. Even if we get the fitness function wrong, we can replace it with another and then make progress from where we are now, in a new direction. This comes at a cost that we may be wrong. Actually, it's much stronger than that. It assumes that we will probably be wrong, but that's still okay, because if we are wrong, we can recover from it. This is a substantially more robust approach. It means that we can begin work on problems and projects uh, that we have no idea how to solve when we begin. Think of SpaceX building their Starship right now, or closer to home, think of the companies that started work building the public cloud. In both of these cases, they began work with only the vaguest of visions uh, of the outcomes that they'd like to achieve. They didn't know the solution before they began, and they had no idea of the problems that they would need to solve along the, along the way. 
This is really the essence of working iteratively, making progress in many small steps towards some even vague goal. The next question then is how small are those small steps? By modern standards, the first iPhone was a fairly crude device. A modern iPhone is dramatically more capable. I'm sure that Apple began by assuming that they would improve their product over time. But I'm equally certain that they didn't know in 2007 what an iPhone in 2022 would be like. Apple releases a new phone once or twice a year. This is a slow pace of iteration, but it's still iteration. For software, when someone mentions working iteratively, what you'll probably have in mind is something a little faster. Maybe the sprints or iterations from Scrum or Extreme Programming, a cycle usually of a couple of weeks. Every couple of weeks we create releasable code and put it out into production. In continuous delivery we turn the volume up further, working so that our software is releasable all the time. Iteration works at all of these speeds, and there are certainly practical limits on how fast you can go to create a new iPhone, but in information terms, the faster you iterate, the clearer it is where you are at any given point, and the lower co the cost of any mistake that you make. You can take this idea surprisingly far if you value it highly enough. Tesla recently upgraded their Model 3 production. They changed the Model 3 so that the maximum charge rate was increased from 200 kilowatt hours to uh, 250. This change included reconfiguring the factory and the manufacturing process that built Model 3 cars. The change took three hours. That's because Tesla optimized everything for fast iteration. The change was possible because it was driven by a software change, and Tesla take test-driven development approach to such changes. So they could be confident in it and get feedback on it really quickly. In software, testing is important for iteration. Without it, we can't iterate quickly or safely. So working iteratively reinforces our need to test, which of course has many nice side benefits, beyond only allowing us to iterate more quickly. What all of this means is that iteration amplifies and reinforces our need to work in small steps and to reflect on what we find after each small step. To test as we go, and informally at least, encourages us to take a more experimental approach to change. This has a profound impact on how we organise our work and on the quality of our work and the complexity of the systems that we are able to build. One of the many positive impacts that working iteratively has is that it forces us to expect that we will need to change our code in the future. That, in turn, encourages us to take a more defensive approach to design. Teams that practice the kind of development that I recommend on this channel are completely comfortable with changing their systems at any point. They regard it as normal. When I first read Kent Beck's book, Extreme Programming Explained, I don't think I got the significance of its subtitle, Embrace Change. I now see this as of profound importance at all levels of granularity. When we work iteratively and design defensively to do that safely and reliably, we're comfortable revisiting code and changing it as our understanding expands. If we work in ways that allow us to do this efficiently, then we're comfortable and confident to make such changes as our products or our market in which they, they operate evolves too. As demand for our systems grow, we can accommodate that. As consumer demand and expectations shift, we can accommodate that too. I don't mean to be naive about this. Some of these changes may be more difficult than others, but they will rarely, if ever, be insurmountable. Fundamentally, software development and the organisations that practice it are part of a complex adaptive system. I don't believe that it's possible to work within a complex adaptive system sensibly without iteration. This may seem abstract, but it is not. This technique is at the heart of every successful software development that I have ever heard of, even when they didn't think of it that way. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.